Hello my friends, Tracy from Salem here today. Um, just dropping in uh, to work a little bit on this, on my current project. Um, so a friend of mine uh, commissioned me to make a coworker, um, commissioned me to make, she has a um, morning matcha tea ritual. Um, and she asked if I would make like a little cloth for her to have all her matcha things on. Um, and I agreed. I'm not entirely sure why, <laughs> because, uh, you know, I knew that I'd be doing stuff that is not really my style. My style is not her style. Um, and, uh, I find commissions, like the idea of a commission quite fraught, right? Somebody has an idea in their head of this thing that they want from you. You're never going to make what's in their head, right? You're never going to do that. Um, and, um, you're just, I feel like it's gonna end up being disappointing. And um, also like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna spend a bunch of time on something that is not my style and not what I am doing myself in my own work. And so I probably, this is probably the last commission I will do. Um, but I've learned a ton, a ton. And it feels like a real gift to be doing this for her. Um, so anyway, here, here I am, here I am. And so, um, so what I, what I'm doing is she wanted a quilt, uh, or not a quilt, but like a cloth that would, um, you know, she told me the colors that she wanted. Um, and then she wanted it to be inspired by, or, or in conversation with the, her favorite, um, um, Mary Oliver poem, which is uh, Wild Geese, and particularly the end of the poem where it, where it talks about the world calls to you like the wild geese over and over announcing your place in the family of things, which is, uh, you know, I, I, I've kind of condensed some lines, but it's that feeling of being called your place in the family of things. She's very much a family person. She's also in her early 30s, so she's, you know, she's looking for her place in the world and making her mark in the world. So <clears throat> that's the inspiration. And I think ultimately what will happen is I will I will stitch those lines like on the back of the cloth. Um, and so for the front of the cloth, what I thought about was the flying goose pattern. Um, which you may know if you're a quilter, you probably know, and I, I am not a quilter and I have never done flying the fine goose block. Um, but so I spent a lot of time on the internet, right? <laughs> uh, flying goose block is, um, is this block, uh, if you're, if you're not familiar with it and this is the goose and this is the sky. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of things online about how to make like four blocks at once with no waste. And I thought that was all very cool. Uh, but what I, what I really, really struggled with was <laughs> just the math. There's so, so much math. And I'm kind of a math atheist. I mean, it's not that I don't believe in math. I just don't believe that I will ever understand math <laughs> and be able to do it well. Um, so I even found some sites where they had like, uh, you know, like charts, like if you want your block to be one inch by two inch, cut your squares to be this size. And, um, and, and here's a little formula about like how to uh, scale up, right? Um, or how to create wh whatever you want, whatever size you want. And then you add this much around it for the large block, for the large square, and then this much for the smaller squares. And then, you um, but the problem is, all of them started at like one inch to two inches, one inch by two inches, but I wanted my square to be one and a quarter by three quarters, or three quarters by one and a quarter, you know what I'm trying to say. And I couldn't find any, any way to figure out how to scale it down. And so I just never could figure out how to do this thing where you make, make four of them in one thing. It, and, and it began to hurt my head and I began to feel kind of dumb and, and then I'm depressed by it. <laughs> so, so I stopped. <laughs> and, um, but luckily my mom know, has uh, done a lot of study of old quilts. I mean, she just knows a shit ton about old textiles, quilts and samplers and stuff. 
Um, and luckily I finally just broke down and went to her and she told me that in some of the old quilts, um, people will do their, their geese another way, um, right? Instead of s sewing the, the two blocks together, um, I don't think I, I don't think there's instructions in here, but, um, you, uh, they would just take a strip that would be the sky color and then cut out triangles of the goose color and applique them on. Uh, thank God, thank the goddess, because that is what, that is how I finally did this. Um, so then I also wanted to, um, so the other thing I thought about is I wanted to honor, my uh, friend and colleague is African American um, and from the South, from Louisiana. And so I wanted to honor both her Southern heritage and also her um, African heritage um, and her African ancestors uh, and African American ancestors, all, both all. Um, and so I remember the, the quilts of Guy's Bend, um, which is um, this like little community in the South in, uh, I think it's Georgia, I believe. Um, or no, sorry, it might be Alabama, my apologies. It's Alabama. Um, and this is a community who are all direct descendants of the enslaved people who worked on a cotton plantation uh, established by Joseph Guy. And so then afterwards, when they were freed after the Civil War, um, they remained on that plantation as sharecroppers. Um, and then, you know, during the Depression, um, you know, and everything crashed, uh, and um, the government provided loans um, to former plantations, or uh, enabling the residents, I should say, not to the plantation, but enabling the residents to acquire the, the, the land and the farm formally. Um, and so the residents of Guy's Bend have lived there since, um, since their ancestors were enslaved on that land. Um, and they have this amazing quilt culture and uh, make these amazing quilts. And I saw a bunch of them in the Museum of, of Fine Arts in Boston in like February or something. Um, and they uh, know a lot about quilting um, and they know the rules, but they, but they bend them in these really interesting ways. Um, so you'll see, so this is a quilt um, made by um, Annie Bendolph, uh, who lived um, 1900 to 1981. Um, and so Annie obviously knows this traditional block called the flying goose. Um, and it's very, very geometric, as you saw maybe in this picture here. Um, it's a very geometric shape. And everyone I saw making them on YouTube and stuff, they had like all their rulers out and they were perfectly cutting them and they're, you know, so they're like very perfectly lined up um, and, they're, and, it, and they're very geometric. Um, and you'll see what Annie did here. Um, and I'm wondering if she used the, um, the technique actually of creating a strip and then appliquing the geese on it. Because you'll see, although it, every once in a while you can see what looks like two blocks meeting, it's, it's hard to see. Um, but you'll see that it is not straight. It has these really wonderful curves and she's created these really wonderful um, kind of a, a feeling of flow and of flying um, in what could be a very geometric um, quilt. Um, and so I decided to take Annie's quilt as my inspiration to honor my friends, both African American heritage and her Southern heritage. So then what am I going to do? Um, and you know, this went on, the, the, the designing of it went on forever. Um, this was my original design. Oddly enough, it's where I ended up, but, um, the, the, the trying to make the, the perfect, trying to figure out the proportions of the quilt and measuring it all out. And I was going insane. This is just not my happy place. And it's probably why I'm not a quilter. Uh, just like all this, you have to be very precise with your measuring um, and get, 
Ah, math, math, math with fractions. Why hasn't America gone to the metric system? <laughs> I studied it when I was a kid um, because we all thought we were going that way and we never did and, uh, and fractions, yeah. So, you know, at first I was gonna have the, uh, the I, I picked out the, the parts of the poem I was gonna put, um, which I read already. And first I was gonna put them on the front of the quilt and then, um, then I was thinking maybe the back and I was trying to figure out these proportions and it just was making me crazy. And then I tried, then I thought maybe I'll do it as a diamond, which is how she does sort of like the interior. Um, but ultimately I went back to this basic design. Um, and what I'll do is I will stitch the words on the back. Um, so then I put together my, my flying geese. <laughs> um, and I did it, uh, so it was still a t shit ton of measuring. So let me stop saying a shit ton. <laughs> there was a lot of measuring. A lot of measuring was happening. Um, and finally, I kind of created these, uh, I don't have them with me, but like this, I, I used some, you know, that clear plastic that they used to uh, uh, write, that they used to use like an overhead projectors and they would write on the clear plastic. I forget what you call, it, call that, but it's just that clear plastic. And I, I finally, like, I just couldn't figure out any other way to do it. So I just created the blocks, the, the, this block, the blue block, the blue L, like a blue L, um, one and a quarter inches wide, um, plus, plus, uh, hem, um, and then figured out how to make the, the triangles so that essentially they would be, um, three quarters of an inch high. And it has been painstaking, painstaking, right? So first I, First I tacked down the, um, the hem on the blue, and then I needle turn appliqued these little guys. I made like a triangle big enough that it included the, um, the, the um, hem, and then the triangle that's the actual size, and drew that around, and oh my God, it was so painstaking. <laughs> and it's not, it's not amazing and tidy and perfect. And, you know, okay. <laughs> I can see all the little stitches. Um, but you know what? It's, it's going to be fine. And when it all gets done, it'll be fine. So, like, let it go, Blanchard. Um, so now I have my, um, and I did them so that, so that there's um, five and three five and three, five and three, so that they're kind of, so they, they will go like this. And I brought like, well, I brought, I brought a bunch of greens and a bunch of blues to her. And so she picked out this and this, and I picked out this for this guy. Um, although, you know, the way I just had it was also kind of cool. That's kind of cool too, isn't it? Well, we'll see what happens. I think, I think, well, gosh, I do kind of like that actually. All right, well, I might have just redesigned it just in this moment, but the original <laughs> idea is like this. I don't know, I feel like I should put a poll, a YouTube poll. Can I put polls on YouTube? Which way should I do it? All right, anyway, that's not for right now. So that took me, yeah, two full nights to make those. Uh, so now I've cut the front and I've cut the back and I will stitch the quote on the back and I will use this blue for a border. Um, but now I wanna put a little, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sandwich this felt. It's it's not entirely flowy, but it's not entirely stiff either. Um, and I had thought about maybe like Pelon or something like that, but I didn't want it super stiff. I wanted it to have movement just like the geese, right? Um, and so I just want to put a little of myself in here because this is not me. 
Um, and so I thought about doing some running stitch. Um, I want to be really gentle about it because I don't want this to shrink up. So I just want it to be very gentle. And I, um, yeah, I don't know if I will cover every space uh, or not. Um, but first I'm just going to start with, I just made these um, swirls. Uh, and recently I've been working on a different project in, and in the sky I'm doing this kind of um, Van Gogh sky, you know, with all his swirls. And so that's where I got the idea for this. Um, so I, I love that some of my pieces are starting to talk to other my, of my pieces. That's, that's fun. Although, you know, obviously only I will know it and the three people that watch this video. So now I have to pick a thread. So I want like a super fine thread. Um, and I almost went with like a, a, a Nona, I mean, maybe I will actually, I don't know. Let me get it out. Um, like one of these like Nona threads, Tamaritius, um, cotton thread. It doesn't quite work because I just want it to be so light. I don't want the fabric to pucker, um, Let's see, that might be, no, I don't think that really works either. I don't think either of those colors really work is the problem. Okay, so I have these. Now, these two are linen from Steph Francis, and this is from the Thread Gatherer, like a pearlate. <clears throat> a pearl. Pearl? Pearlay? I've heard people say it both ways. Um, I think this is the one that would kind of disappear the most, really just leaving like a, um, just the feeling, the textural feeling of things happening in the sky, right? So it almost completely disappears. And it is, um, as you can see, it is um, variegated. But when you actually put the thread down, you can barely see any change. I mean, there's a little, there's a little. Um, I think this is the one that would, would like disappear the most and just, so then it would really just be about the texture of it. And these two would obviously stand out more. Now this is like just fully blue. Maybe it won't stand out, maybe because it's so thin maybe it won't actually stand that well. You can see that variegation, I think, much more. I don't know if you can see it on camera. Um, but again, it would be, it would, it would be some, a little bit more about the color, but still a lot about the texture. Um, this one would pick up the color in the geese, maybe. Again, it's so very thin. Uh, let's see. So there would be pops of green, which would be in conversation with the Greece, geese, the, the Greeks, <laughs> the geese, um, periodically, although, uh, you know, a, a fair amount of it is going to disappear. So I don't, I don't know which. So I think having laid this out, I feel like maybe this one is is not really the one. Oopsie. Hmm. 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 Very tough call. Very tough call. I think I'm gonna go with the one that's that has a little bit of the green in it. Um, I think that's what I'm going to do. So there, there we go. Um, yeah, so just get started on this. I kind of really want to use one of these darners because I just want it to be whisper thin and not create 
any holes or anything. But I will tell you, I'm not, I don't understand. So I got, I got the um, Sue Spargo needle pack, like the full needle pack. Um, so it has two, two sizes of chenille, two sizes of tapestry. It has three sizes of milliners and it has these two sizes of darners. The thing is, the hole on this needle is so phenomenally small that I actually can't even get the um, threader through it. I can't even get the threader through it, it to help me thread the thread, let alone get any threads through it. So I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to get this thread in. And, and I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of these needles is. If you can't get a thread through it, and this is the larger of the two, this is the nine. I don't know how you get anything through the 11. I mean, what? Yeah, I can't, can't even thread that. So I'm, I am flummoxed as to the purpose of the darners, but okay, that's fine. I will use the, uh, 24 tapestry. Let's see, I might have one that is actually slimmer. That's from my own stash of needles. This one is a little bit, this one is slimmer than the 24 chenille. I've, I've tried threading that side so many times, it's fraying now. Oh, it's going through a little bit. Ah, of course, because I'm on the video, right? and my threader is on the other side of the room. But I will have to go get it. Oh, and obviously I've put it somewhere because I don't see it here in my little notions. Oh, here it is, here it is, here it is. Good gracious. All right, so a little quilter's knot at the end. All right, so I'm just gonna start, this is gonna go f flying off somewhere, I know it. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm just gonna start in the middle. No, I'm gonna start at this end. And I just wanna do a tiny little running stitch and I wanna constantly be making sure that I am keeping it very loose. So it is a lovely day here in the Northeast. Um, the window is open and there's a lovely breeze coming through. I went on a hike, hike, I went on a wood walk um, the other day to Ravenwood, Ravenswood Park, which is in Gloucester, Massachusetts, uh, just about half an hour north of where I live. Um, in Salem and not not half an hour because it's far away it's not it's just that driving anywhere <laughs> takes a long time but it's a lot of back roads between here and um, Ravenswood Park uh, but there's also just always a lot of traffic here it's there's no escape you have to go much farther north 
to get away from traffic. Um, even though I'm not in Boston, it's still, it's still pretty bad here. Um, let's see, how does that look? So that feels much bolder than I want it to be. But it is just about to change color here. But still, I think these stitches are larger than I want. Um, I just want something much more subtle. So I can't believe I'm about to unthread this needle after all of that. But um, I, I want that to be, I want those stitches to be much smaller and more subtle. So I used the um, friction pen to, to draw this on and that will come off easy peasy with um, heat, which I have already tested this particular fabric to make sure that that is true. Um, so I was saying I went to Ravenswood Park uh, with a friend of mine who is um, leaving her her job. Um, so I think I've mentioned before on um, this channel that um, I have a day job in higher education, uh, but my, my side hustle, if you will, um, which I don't like to call it a side hustle at all, um, but I am a spiritual companion, or some people call it spiritual director, uh, spiritual mentor, spiritual guide, is all kinds of words for it. Um, and um, let's see, I want the stitch to be small, and the length underneath to be longer. And so what that means is that I know a lot of <laughs> I know a lot of people who work in uh, religious occupations, um, ministers and directors of religious education, uh, um, so that still seems pretty large. What am I? I want it to be smaller than that. I maybe can't do a regular running stitch. I maybe have to go up and down. Oh my God, how many times are you gonna watch me thread this stinking needle? Um, and a, uh, a lot of these folks are so burned out uh, that they are, you know, leaving, leaving their positions. I know several folks who are leaving their positions. Um, in churches, uh, and they're just they're just really burned out. Um, uh, you know, they've taken up a lot a lot of uh, uh, you know other work um, in the church in the church to help the congregation through this tough time. Um, you know, often unpaid. <laughs> um, and I think anyone who's part of a congregation will know that congregants tend to assume that their religious professionals should be available 24/7. <laughs> that that's like somehow part of the part of the work, um, and so they're just they're just burned out. I feel like this is uh, yeah, that's okay. That's all right. I was going to say that might still be bigger than I want, but forget it. I'm going on. <laughs> I'm not rethreading this needle again. You know, so I've been just, uh, you know, being there for them and, and supporting them. Um, it's one of the reasons I never uh, wanted to be a minister, um, aside from the fact that it's a lot more administrative than you might think. Um, Wow, have I been doing this whole thing off camera? I probably have. Shoot. 
That blows. My apologies. Um, but also just, I, I, I am too much of an introvert to be able to be like on call all the time for folks. Um, it's, it's just not, I could not handle that pace or that, or that expectation. Am I once again off camera? How about if I adjust the camera? That better um, so anyway um, went on a beautiful walk in the woods and it is indeed a beautiful time of year it was it was quite warm <laughs> it was quite warm uh, although not as warm as it was like two, last weekend or two weekends ago whenever I took my that last hike um, that was brutal um, but it was pretty, it was pretty darn warm, <laughs> but so great to be in the woods, to be, um, I just, you know, the woods, I love the dappled light. I love the bird song. I love the smells. Um, it's just very, very restorative to me to be in nature. And I have to say that nature is where I most frequently experience uh, source, spirit, goddess, whatever word, whatever words you use for that thing that's larger than yourself. Um, that kind of, you know, like the force. I thought, I think that, <laughs> I think George Lucas the, I think the force is like one of the great, great descriptions of that energy that flows through everything. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where I feel it so easily. I don't have to do much of anything to feel the presence of the divine in the woods. Uh, it's just, it's just in everything. Everything is of it. Um, and it's very, yeah, restorative. And even when you're alone in the woods, you're not alone, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was really fun. And I hope to get out and do a lot more, uh, Walks. I used to walk all the time by myself, and you know, quite bizarrely, um, the pandemic, I stopped walking so much, and just or just going out into nature. Isn't that bizarre? I mean, you would think it would be the exact opposite. For a lot of people, it was the exact opposite. They got out more because they could, because they didn't have to commute to the office and whatnot, um, take kids to the you know 10,000 activities or whatever a lot of people get out more and for whatever reason I actually kind of became very hermity I'm not sure what yeah I don't really quite know why but there you go and so I've been trying to get a lot of walks on my calendar with friends um, and get get out and about um, or if I was Canadian right I'd say out in a boot Sorry, Canadians, I am not mocking you. I love, I love Canada. You are like such great neighbors. <laughs> you really are. And uh, um, hopefully you won't mind if a whole bunch of us move there soon, right? <laughs> anyway, I'm kidding. I'm kidding when I'm, only when I'm kidding. Um, anyway, that was, that was joyous and joyful. Um, but what's, you know, what I think what one of the reasons is because I really kind of committed to stitching in a much bigger way during the pandemic and I just want to do it all the time <laughs> and you can't really, you can't really walk and stitch at the same time, right? Am I even remotely on the camera? I feel like I 
need to watch this video to see if I'm even remotely on the camera. So um, right now it can be hard to see because the pink is uh, so powerful, but um, once I iron that up, uh, I think you'll be able to see these stitches much better. And so I think, I think that's working out well. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue on with this. Um, and then I'm gonna, let's see, let me zoom out again. And then I will um, applique down my geese. Uh, and then I will do the back. Um, and just waiting for the next uh, Roxy's Journal of Stitchery. I'm not sure if I showed my, my May page. Um, I can't remember if I showed the finished, the finished work. Um, so this is the finished May block uh, with my um, egret and I, as you can see my favorite color blue <laughs> uh, so and I had done um, I had done the same kind of background for what was the flower one I think it was March or fe February I really don't know whatever month this was where it was neutral background and flowers um, I had done this um, weaving thing um, and kind of a made up stitch um, in the uh, in the corners here, um, which I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, I really loved the way that came out. Um, but on this one, I decided to do um, because I'm trying to learn all the stitches in the Sue Spargo book. And so I did this wonderful thing, which is probably gonna become like one of my favorite stitches um, in between. And it's like the Spanish, uh, I can't remember the name of it, um, but I love the way that came out. And I love the way my egret came out. And I, I need, it needs some tidying. And you know, I, I have some stuff to get, to, to practice, to get better. Um, but I really love the way that came out ultimately. And so I've decided, so the other project I'm working on is a memory cloth. If you've watched any of my other, let me see if I can get this over here. Uh, I'm gonna drop everything. <laughs> I'm working on this memory cloth um, from, which is an idea from Expressive Stitches, that book, Expressive Stitches. Is that the name of it? Jan Dawson. Um, and the memory I'm doing is of a particular journey, uh, like shamanic journey that I took with Egret as my um, guide. And so that same Egret I'm gonna do, uh, now that I've done it once and I know where I need to, like the head part is not, not fantastically done. Um, and I know exactly what I, how, how to do this better. So that's great, I, lots of learning. So I'm going to do this egret here on my, um, that Van Gogh sky I was telling you about with the swirly uh, things. So uh, that, I'm, that I'm bringing over here. So I have all these cloths that are, um, you know, ideas are jumping from one thing to another um, and I, I love that. I love that. So right now I'm putting in my usual moon with its rings. Then I'll put the egret here and then I will work on these panels. Um, but this is what I've got so far. On these panels. And these, you know, these are some things from the, um, from the journey. Um, and so it's, it's creating, it's like capturing the memories of some, some memories of that journey, um, into this cloth. So, yeah, so that's, that's where all the things are. Hope you're having a great, uh, lovely weekend of stitching. Um, enjoy Memorial Day, uh, tomorrow and, um, I just want to show respect 
to the men and the women of the armed services who are um, keeping our country safe and who are, uh, yeah, who give, agree to forfeit their lives if necessary for the country. I don't want them to do that. I, don't, I mean, I don't want them to die. Um, and I just want to appreciate their service. Um, and I would love for us to get to some place in the history where all those folks could also be, because the world is peaceful, uh, we, they can be deployed around our country to help um, help our country. That would be great to like build roads and um, build schools and help rehabilitate communities uh, that are impoverished and all kinds of help that our country could use. It would be great if those folks, if that was their job, because the world was full of peace, but we're not there right now. So this is maybe thinking that I'll, making me think that I'll close with the Druid prayer for peace. Deep in the center of my being, may I find peace. Let me start again. Deep in the center of our beings, may we find peace. Generously in the grove of our communities, may we share peace. Powerfully across this beautiful animate earth, may we radiate peace. May there be peace in the north, may there be peace in the south, may there be peace in the west, and may there be peace in the east. So what would it be?